Good evening, ladies. We're so excited. Um, I want to start by just drawing your attention to the screen for our women's prayer retreat that's coming up in July in Rutledge. All the information is here, $50 plus your meals. And for more information, you can contact Lynn Cates at 678-300-7582, or you can walk right over to her right there and talk to her. <laughs> Lynn, raise your hand. So, but just wanted to draw your attention. And isn't it interesting when God emphasizes and repeats himself, because what was last week's session on? Prayer and fasting. Um, so just be in prayer about that and talk to Lynn for more information. And if you were not able to be here last week, I cannot encourage you enough to go to uh, the, the website and click on it. <clears throat> I don't know how to get to the YouTube page. There's an address, but you can go to First Conyers Women's Ministry, and it says Cornerstone Wednesday night, and then you can find the teaching that way. So if you didn't get a chance to watch it... Oh, and, and women's Facebook page, FC Women on Facebook. So, but I really, if you, if you missed it, you don't want to miss it. So go back. So, and tonight, we're just excited to hear what we're going to learn through Mordecai, the, the man who humbly walked with God, and the exact antithesis, <laughs> Haman, uh, who, Haman, the hangman, and boy, does he have a surprise waiting for him. So, <laughs> all right, well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Get started. Heavenly Father, we just stand and sit before you with hearts bowed. And we so desire uh, to learn from you, to learn from your truth, to learn from the people that walked long before us with you in faith and faith belief. And so, Lord, we just pray that you would prepare our hearts, open our hearts and our ears to hear and receive what you have, that you would transform us and conform us into the image of your son. We pray a blessing over our sweet sister, Karen, that you would empower her, fill her with your Holy Spirit, and that you would minister by the truth of your word through the power of your Holy Spirit this very night. We love you so much, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. I remember uh, one time when my oldest was about four years old, um, she and her brother and two of our friends were over at our house, and the mom was with me, and they were upstairs playing, and uh, so the, the mom was with me downstairs, and we were just talking, and there was the normal kid noises upstairs, laughing and talking, and after a little bit, it got quiet up there, and, um, you know, uh, if you're a mom and you have kids that age, you know that if it gets quiet, you need to pay attention, right? <laughs> so I called up the stairs, and I said, Laura! Yeah, what are you doing? And she says, we're not doing anything. Don't come up here. <laughs> <laughs> so both of us moms launched out of our seats as fast as we could, ran up the stairs to see what was going on. And there we see all four of the kids were in the floor of our bathroom. And they had, they had dumped out all the shampoo and conditioner and the baby powder in a big pile. And they were making cake. <laughs> so, uh, the, uh, so in this instance, what we learn from that is when things are quiet, doesn't mean nothing's happening, right? <laughs> and that's the point of this chapter um, that we're going to get to and discuss tonight in Esther. And um, as usual, we're going to walk through the actual events of what happens, and we're going to look for application. I've got two applications. One I'll do in the middle because it's smaller. I didn't want to go over it, and then the bigger one at the end like usual and so we're up to chapter six and if you were here two weeks ago when we walked through the events of chapter uh, five we found out that esther approached the king after three nights of prayer and fasting which we talked about last time but instead of blurting out what she wanted right away right there in the middle of the courtroom she invited xerxes and haman to a feast and they've had a great time good food and xerxes says you know what do you want esther and um, instead of Say, tell him what he wants right there. She invites him to another feast, and she promises that if he comes to that one, she'll tell him what she wants. And so the second banquet is set, and at the end of chapter 5, the three people depart and go in different directions, and the action follows Mordecai, uh, sorry, Haman on the way home 
where he runs into Mordecai, who continues to refuse to bow to him, which infuriates Haman. And uh, so he's blocked out everything else that he can, he can't think about anything else but the fact that he's being um, uh, dissed by Mordecai. And so he's already secured the order from, from Xerxes to annihilate the entire people group, but that won't happen for most of a year later. And that's not fast enough for him. And so he's so mad about all this that he can't think about anything else and he can't wait that long. So he takes the ill-advised uh, um, advice of his wife and friends so that he build a gallows to have, uh, hey, uh, have Mordecai hung on. And if you remember last time when we were here, that don't think Old West gallows here is like with a rope and a noose and a trap door. The, uh, for a Persian's execution was on a spike. He was basically impaled. 75 feet tall, ridiculously oversized. Um, so he sets a team of workers to work on building this, this overnight project, so it'll be ready the next day. And he's so confident that he can uh, manipulate Xerxes again that he goes and uh, plans to go in and talk to the king right away and get permission to kill Mordecai. Now, if you read the chapter this week, you'll realize that this is the, probably the most tragic, a little bit uh, comedic, and even, uh, certainly ironic chapter in perhaps all the Bible. And the change that takes place, in, of course, these few verses is monumental. And, the process, and in the process of this part of the story, we're going to learn some crucial life lessons for us today. So let's get to it. Verse 1 says... That night the king could not sleep, so he ordered the book of the Chronicles, the record of his reign, to be brought in and read to him. Okay, for so for some reason, Xerxes can't sleep. Maybe Esther used too many spices. Maybe he's thinking about the banquet tomorrow. Maybe the whole thing with the Greek war is still bothering him. Maybe the noise from building the gallows is keeping him awake. But for whatever reason, he is up. And instead of calling for someone to, from the harem to come give him a massage to relax him or have the chef make some warm goat's milk and Persian cookies or taking a walk, a late night stroll, the thing that he thinks is going to put him to sleep is reading the record of his whole kingdom. Now that's funny to me. <laughs> I mean, it's like this is the, bit, the, the, like the minutes of a business meeting. Everything is recorded in these things. Uh, you know, invasion details about invasions and tributes that are brought and building projects, decrees that are handed down. Really boring stuff here. And so <laughs> it's kind of ironic. He wants to go, go to sleep, so he's like, read me this boring stuff about myself. <laughs> and so he comes to this part in verse 2. It was found in the record there that Mordecai had exposed, exposed Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's officers, who guarded the doorway, who had conspired to assassinate King Xerxes. And if you remember back to chapter 2, we learned about this back then. Mordecai was at the city gate. He's an official there, overheard these two guys talking, and he, uh, uh, he, he heard about the plot. He told Esther. Esther told the king, and they gave credit to Mordecai. So that was written down in this, this record book. This was like five years ago, though. And so when, when the king hears this, he wants to know the rest of the story, so he's like, what honor and recognition has Mordecai received for this? Not, and the attendants tell him, nothing has been done for him. Now, in this day and age, it was really important for those who were loyal to the king to, to be rewarded because it was a means of protecting their own safety. So it, it benefited you to report, to, if, it, if it benefited you to report suspicious activity, then you were more likely to do it, right? And so for, there was one example from Xerxes' reign where somebody who had uh, heard about a plot to kill his brother who had exposed the plot, and what happened with him was is he was made governor of a whole city. So, you know, completely life changed just because reporting this activity. And so this is common knowledge around the kingdom. Uh, so if it was a, it's to be advantage, it was advantage, it was advantageous to you to, uh, to be loyal to the king. Lots of good things came your way. People knew about it, and they expected that when they heard something and reported it. So wealth, honor, position, you want those things, just be loyal to the king. And Mordecai didn't get that. Five years later, and you know, he could have pushed for this. He had the ear of the queen, right? He could have said, you know, that thing where I uh, 
uh, heard about the assassinations, you know, he's forgotten about that. You know, he doesn't remember that I was the guy. Can you just mention that to the king when you're with him? And that would have been true. Reward was in order, but he didn't get that, and he didn't insist. He didn't push up for it. And there's no indication that he carried any kind of grudge against the king or anybody else for not receiving it. And jumping forward to where we are in the story now, what would have happened if he had inserted his rights or demanded what was due? Way back then, four or five years ago. You know, the, this apparent overlook in the reward needed to happen for the story to unfold the way it did, right? But Mordecai doesn't know there's any reward ever coming. He doesn't know that there's a reason for the delay. He just knows that he's been overlooked and at this point has no expect expectation that anything will ever come his way. And, but here's this man of faithfulness and godliness here to in fact, in fact say, you know what, I did the right thing regardless of whether it benefits me or not. And here's the mini application in the middle of here, not the main one, but definitely a takeaway that we need today is that we need to learn to serve God do what's right, and then trust him with the rewards. God calls us to follow him first. He tells us how to interact with others all through the scriptures, to be kind, be loving, be encouraging, forgiving, let go of offenses. All these things are standard behavior for Christians. Uh, and, but sometimes we get our focus off of doing what's right because God tells us to, and, and we do the things we should do, for personal benefit, right? I mean, for recognition. We want the credit. We want the people to say, hey, you did a good job. Hey, that was really awesome for you to do that. Now, while it's great for people to notice and appreciate us and to respond to us, well, that should not ever be the motivator for doing what's right. So, so think about it. If you do something nice for somebody and they don't notice, they don't say thank you, or they don't even care, what is your attitude? What are you? What are you angry? Do you hold a self-justified grudge? If so, then ask you why are you doing things in the first first place? Was it because it was the right thing to do? Was it because God called you to do something to serve or to be kind or forgive or whatever? But if you expect or demand a response, then is your focus? in the wrong place. Not on just doing what's right, but about receiving reward, even if that reward is just a thank you. Our unwillingness to keep our focus in the right place with God at the center for our motivations does reveal in us a lack of trust and a skewed perspective because personal reward shouldn't be the point. We don't do things because of personal benefit. We trust God and then do it anyway. Because here's what Jesus said about rewards. If anyone gives a, even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones who is my disciple, truly I tell you, that person will certainly not lose their reward. God sees. Nothing escapes his notice. So if you're doing something for someone, trust what Jesus said right here. Trust this verse. He hasn't forgotten you. He hasn't overlooked your obedience or your willingness to follow his command. Adjust your focus to what it says in Colossians chapter 3. Whatever you do, do your work heartily. That's not just an occupation. That's anything you do for God or any motivation. Work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men. Knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. Um, so, so we have to remember to be like Mordecai here. Do right. Follow the Lord. Do whatever you do, anything, big or small, you are serving Christ first. Do that. Leave the reward to him. So back to our, sto our story. Once Xerxes realizes it's been like five years later, Mordecai hasn't been rewarded. He quickly wants to fix this because this is, you know, terrible for him because he wants people to know that they can... Uh, be rewarded if they're loyal to him. So he says, who's in the court? Now, Haman had just entered the outer court of the palace to speak to the king about hanging Mordecai on the gallows. He had erected 
for him. So it seems like another coincidence, right? This is one of these happenstances that keep piling up in this chapter here. We're really seeing, well, we're really seeing his sovereignty at work here, right? Haman is so set on executing Mordecai, he can't wait till morning. He picks his exact moment, and his purpose being there to go there is to get permission to kill the man that, that Xerxes wants to honor. And so the attendants answer, Haman is standing in the court. Bring him in, the king ordered. When Haman entered, the king asked him a question. What should be done for the man the king delights to honor? Now, he didn't say who it is yet, uh, but Haman is so full of himself here. He says, who is there that the king would rather honor than me? And now, thinking that this is all for him, he starts conjuring up in his head, what am I going to, what would I want? What do I really want? And that's what he really wants most is for the, to be king himself. I mean, he doesn't really need any more possessions or more power. He's already number two man in the kingdom. He's already got the king's signet ring. He can make laws in his, in, in his name. And so everybody's got to bow before him. And so he says what he wants. Verse 7 and 8. For the, for the man the king delights to honor, have them bring a royal robe. The king has worn in a horse that the king has ridden, one with a royal crest placed on his head. Now, the royal crest there on the horse is a crown or decoration on the actual animal that signifies that there's a royal person of uh, a, a king's stature on the horse. So, then he says, let the robe and the horse be entrusted to one of the king's most noble princes. Let them robe the man the king delights to honor and lead him on the horse through the city streets and claim him before him. This is what is done for the man. The king delights to honor. And, uh, you know, now wear this king's robe and to ride this horse has almost a magical aura around it in this day and time. It aligned the person really tightly with the king. And, and it was almost like he was king for a while. He was dressed like this and wear, uh, riding a horse. And it was an immense honor. And so you all can almost see Haman's eyes kind of glaze over as he's describing this. And with the prospect of being honored this way. And he's, he's forgotten why he showed up in the courtyard. He's so taken with himself. But he's about to get jerked, jerked back to reality in the next verse. But it says, go at once, the king commanded Haman. Get the robe and the horse and do just as you suggested. For Mordecai the Jew, who sits at the king's gate, do not neglect anything you have recommended. And you can imagine the shock that landed on Haman at this moment. I mean, he has no idea what happened just moments before in, in the court in the in the courtroom where um, they're reading and they, he hears about the thing that, that Mordecai has done for him. He doesn't know about reading of the books. He doesn't eat, and he doesn't remember that Mordecai had saved the king if he ever knew it at all. This just comes out of the blue. Xerxes suddenly picks this moment to honor Haman's arch enemy, and so what happens? Haman doesn't have any choice. This is an edict from the king, so he got the robe and the horse, rode Mordecai, led him on horseback throughout the city, proclaiming before him, this is what is done for the man the king delights to honor. This has got to be Haman's worst nightmare here. <laughs> he couldn't imagine anything being worse. So he goes, gets Mordecai, dresses him all up, sets him on the king's horse, and then led him around the city, listening to the cheers and the accolades as he is saying this pronouncement in front of him. And then we get another window into Mordecai. Afterward, Mordecai returned to the king's gate. We get his character here shows, shines brightly. He doesn't flaunt this turn, turn of events. I mean, as you know, because he knows that there's this conflict between the two of them. And this, he's been elevated above him like this. It would be very easy to, to say, yeah, you got yours. But we don't see any of that going on here. Um, he doesn't celebrate, doesn't embrace the moment. In fact, he remains silent throughout this entire ordeal and quietly and humbly goes back to his job. But Haman rushed home with his head covered in grief, humiliated. Now, the first reason is obvious, right? He's had to... Uh, 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 elevate his arch enemy and it is mortifying for him to have to honor him like that and, and remember he was about to ask the king to, to execute Mordecai and now he knows this will never happen this is it, that's all over the honor that he just got meant that his alignment with the king is now public and permanent 
And so the status of Mordecai has changed in the kingdom because of this. And everything uh, that Haman was trying to do to get rid of Mordecai is undone right here in this moment. And then we have verse 13. He rushes home, tells Zeresh and his friends everything that's happened to him. His advisors and his wife Zeresh say to him, Since Mordecai, before whom your example has started, is of Jewish origin, you cannot stand against him. You will surely come to ruin. And they're right, right? There's so many events that have lined up so perfectly in flip-flops here in this chapter that even Haman's family and friends recognize that this is not coincidence, right? I mean, these are pagan unbelievers, and they attribute what happened to divine intervention by the God of the Jews. And so even, uh, so, and they are basically warning him, give up this vendetta because this is not going to go well for you. This went so badly, you need to stop. But while they're talking to him, before he can do anything, the king's eunuchs arrived and hurried Haman away to the banquet Esther had prepared. And that's where chapter 6 ends. We're at another cliffhanger. I have to wait till next week to find out what happens. <laughs> but the coincidences that have he, happened here are pivotal and there's no mistaking God's hand at work in this, right? Remember, this book doesn't mention the name of God at all, but it's unmistakable to see how he is unfolding events as we get this far into the book. And the changes that happen here are poised around a key pivot point of the entire book. And that's what I want to wrap up our time talking about tonight. And this is our takeaway, because for Haman, before this pivot point, he was happy and high in spirit. After, his head is covered with grief. Before, the friends assure Haman that he's going to prevail. And afterward, the friends say Mordecai is going to prevail. Before it, he's intent on e executing Mordecai. And after, Haman ends up exalting Mordecai. Broader sense, the pivot point is not just significant for Haman, but for the entire book. Okay? Before this pivot point, there are three feasts. After there are three feasts, 29 inches of Susa before and 29 after. Haman has the upper hand in all the chapters before. Mordecai has the upper hand in all the chapters after. And if you do a literary analysis, if you went back to you know, high school English class, there's a striking symmetrical balance between the, the beginning of the book and the end of the book. And the events of the end of the book largely undo all of the events of the beginning of the book. Of the book. And right standing at the very center of this story is this significant moment. And so you say, well, what is the significant moment? Is it that Esther took her role uh, as queen more seriously and embraced it as part of saving her people? Could that be it? Is it when she set aside her safety and said, I'm going to enter the king, and if I perish, I perish? Uh, maybe it's her shrewdness in planning two, two uh, banquets instead of one. Maybe it went, it's, it's when Mordecai tells Esther, you have been made for such a time as this. And she catches this new vision of herself and her role. And any of those would be good guesses to the crucial turning point of the entire book here. It's not any of those. Standing right at the center of this book, the pivot point is that night. The king could not sleep. Okay? Uh, literally, this is translated, the sleep of the king fled away. And it's so trivial, so mundane, so seemingly insignificant that you can blow right across it and miss it. Uh, at this moment, on this day, at this time, the king had insomnia. This is not fire from heaven. This is not splitting the sea in half. This is not a wall falling down for somebody being raised from the dead. It's just that he couldn't sleep. And it's just as crucial, just as critical to this story as any of the other flashy miracles that we like to read about in the Old Testament. In fact, this sleepless night is the key moment when the fate of an entire people group is altered. And God was the cause of it just as certainly as he rained fire down at Mount Carmel. In this story, the pivot point actually moves our attention away from the characters and the people that are in the story. This is not Esther's doing. This is not Mordecai's doing. This isn't Xerxes uh, issuing some new rule or any, anything, but it's a sleepless night. 
by moving us our attention away from the people and onto this this insignificant event, we're reminded uh, that that the people in this drama are not the ones that are caused for the change in the outcome. No one person, not even the most powerful person in the entire world at that time, who was Xerxes, is in control of what is about to happen. God is at work, quietly, in the background, in the most subtle ways, directing the action. It's as to, and it is as to, if to take away any thought that this could, could be random, all of these coincidences, coincidences keep piling up. God is working in these little details. The thing that the, key, the king chooses to, to ease his insomnia is to read the record book. Now, remember, this is he's been reigning for like 12 years now, so there's a lot of records. This would be like yeah, back in the old days when you had to go do uh, research, you had to go to the library, right? This would be like walking up to the encyclopedia <laughs> section picking out a random book, opening it up, and happening to land on this record of Mordecai saving the king. This is huge, overwhelming odds against this happening on its own. And what does he read? The incident of Mordecai saving his life, and it changes everything. We could go on and on with all these kind of minute details that happened in this chapter that looks insignificant, on their own, but strung together, uh, there's no way that they could be anything but God's handiwork. And even Haman's pagan family recognized that that's the case. And the whole drama, the whole story of Esther, Mordecai, Haman, the whole fate of the entire Jewish race all turns on sleepless nights. And this is the takeaway from this chapter. God uses the ordinary to do the extraordinary. God uses the ordinary to do the extraordinary. You know, a lot of times we read scripture and you go, wow, if I could only see God do some amazing miracle, I think I would be sure if he would, you know, do a, you know, do something amazing like we see in all of these stories here. If you write it in the sky, then I would be certain. Then I would follow him and I'd be certain. But God does the amazing things all the time. All the time. It's just that we don't notice or we're not paying attention, or we don't choose to give him the credit for what he does do. God uses ordinary things, ordinary events, to alter the course of people's lives all the time and to change the direction of a situation all the time. For me, uh, somebody gave me a free ticket to a concert way back in 1989, and I ended up meeting my husband at that con concert. And I wasn't going to go because I, I didn't have, I was poor, poor and single. And, I didn't, and if they hadn't given me the free ticket, I wouldn't have had it. Um, a free book sent to me by Focus on the Family. I wrote them a letter uh, after hearing, a, hearing a, a broadcast. And they sent me a whole box of materials. And in there was a book that helped me decide to homeschool my kids. Uh, an invitation to a picnic by my son's Sunday school teacher when he was three years old influenced us moving to Conyers. Seemingly mundane, boring events led to radical changes in directions in my life. And you have them too. That phone call, that change in jobs, that advice you got, that place you went, those people you met that one time. All those random events are the invisible hand of God working out his will in your life. Now, of course, not every phone call is going to It'd be a pivot point, right? Not every drive to the grocery store is going to have you meet somebody that's just going to give you advice that's going to send you off in some different direction in your life. Not every book, not every email you receive, but some. Some are. Here's the thing. Just like we discussed all the way back in chapter 4, that you don't really know the moment for which you were made until you look back. It's the same way with this. You don't know the tiny, which tiny detail is going to change the course of your life. In both cases, we assess them when we look backwards. I mean, maybe Xerxes doesn't sleep well on the regular, right? Maybe this was a rare thing, but who knows? I'm thinking that at the moment, nobody was like, oh my gosh, this is the change in the course of history because the king can't sleep, right? They didn't recognize it at the time. But the whole of the story, the preservation of the line of Christ, the covenant promise of God was upheld, and it started with a pagan king's bout with insomnia. We see it now, right? 
easy to see, but at the time, no. And I think the Puritan writer John Flavel said it really good like this. The providence, that is the sovereignty of God, is like Hebrew words. It can only be read backwards. And if you don't know, that the Hebrew language is written right to left instead of left to right. So when you read the words, it goes like this. And that's, that's how the providence of God is. When we look back, we can see it much better. Now, the sovereign involvement of God, shifting, morphing, guiding, changing, unfolding events can only be seen as we look back in retrospect. I mean, the ticket to the concert, the free book, and the uh, preschool picnic, they're only significant because of where I am now, now, right? I can look back and see, wow, those were pivot points in my life. And I can see the fingerprints of God leading me to where I am now. You know that, what that means? The details of your life have greater depth than you can imagine, greater significance than you can grasp, and greater importance than you can realize. When we start to understand and appreciate how deeply God is involved in our lives, it should impact the way we live, right? Every single day is a walk of faith. Every decisions are important. That's why this really comes well after the prayer and fasting thing we did last week, right? Because this is how we learn to hear and see what God is doing in our lives by living in tune with God through prayer, through fasting, through reading his word. Because every day has the potential for those divine moments where he's going to change the course of our lives. We need to be paying attention. Crucial turning points to take us where he wants us to be. Don't think that all those things have to be good things either, right? I mean, God, there's a plenty of disappointments that God uses, heartaches, frustrations, closed doors that are used by God to lead us as well. I told Leah when she's in high school and early college, um, when we're trying to decide what college she should go to and where she should transfer to, I told her, I said, don't bang too hard on a closed door. When we get, because when we don't get what we want, yes, we have disappointment. Yes, it's frustrating. Yes, we don't understand sometimes. But sometimes that is God guiding us away from things and away from places we shouldn't be. I mean, how many of you married your first boyfriend? <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> Some of you did, but <laughs> not, not me. <laughs> and I know I went through a lot of hurt and a lot of heartache and a lot of disappointment. But looking back, I'm grateful. Mm -hmm. I am really grateful. Um, so that's the way we need to look at disappointments, right? God hasn't abandoned you. God's not trying to hurt you. He is intimately involved in your life to the detail of giving the king a sleepless night. As we yield ourselves and become more and more familiar with his ways through his word, through prayer, and we are more able to identify his work in our lives more easily, right? So maybe it doesn't take us 5 or 10 or 15 years to see it. Maybe we learn to recognize his movements more quickly and trust him more easily and more thoroughly. And here's another thing. Maybe then we become instruments in the hand of God to work in the lives of people around us. Maybe the text you send, conversation you have, that encouraging word, that a warning you give to somebody else is the thing that God uses to change the direction of somebody else's life. But our ability to see God move is directly connected to how much we dwell in his word and walk in faithfulness every day. That he might condescend to use us in someone else's this life ought to motivate us to be godly in our living, humble in our responses, careful with our words, and conscious of our responsibility to bear his image well. In the story of Esther, it was a sleepless night. For us, who knows? It can be anything. If you want to learn to see God in your life, then let this part of the story of Esther challenge you to do exactly what Paul instructed Christ followers to do in Ephesians chapter 4. That is, live a life worthy of the calling you have received. To be completely humble and gentle. To be patient, bearing with one another in love. Do what's right. Look for God's hand in everything. And always trust him with the details. Amen? Amen. God, we just thank you that you are the God of the details and that uh, we don't have to wait for it to be written in the sky. 
First of all, we have it written in your word, and we can trust that. And help us to lean on that. And God, help us to look for your hand in the tiny little things of our lives and give you credit. And go where you lead us, either through uh, exciting things or even in the disappointments. God, because you are trustworthy, and you only want to lead us to do your will, which is always the best. And we pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. Quick time, ladies. <laughs>